All right, wonderful to see everybody here this morning as we uh, open God's Word again, once again, and uh, examine the Word of God uh, before us. Let me just say as we begin this session that Christ is our only hope, okay? He is our only hope in life and in death. We need to understand that, and I would beseech each and every one of us to take time to examine the words of God, right? Like, give Twitter a break, give Instagram a break, give TikTok a break, and all these different nets of distraction that we're going to get into here, and focus on the Word of God in spirit and in truth as we wait on the Lord. And as we do, we'll begin to discover the positive, precious message that God has for us in his word that will be life-changing, that will bless you, that will rescue you, that will free you and bless you beyond our ability to contain it. That is the truth of the word of God as we uh, set our minds on these things. Today in this message, we're going to be talking about trusting in God, okay, and trusting in his character, which are, I believe, very important things. We're just going to go through a few things and look up uh, Psalms chapter 24 and 25, which will become kind of the basis of our message as we look into the Word of God and spend time on it this morning um, during this precious time we have with the Lord who has given us the ability to uh, be blessed in His truth. Again, Christ is our only hope. And he is the hope of our salvation and our deliverance. Um, And reading through the Psalms, I I have found you really step into God's own heart. Remember David, the psalmist, was called the man after God's own heart. And so somehow when you read the Psalms, you really begin to see God's goodness. God's goodness his righteousness and his truth that is so evident in the precious word that he has left us. You see his mercy. And David knew that, didn't he? Right? He said, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to keep his covenant and his testimonies. Those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Psalm 24. And so we'll take this time and just learn some lessons from Psalms uh, where it talks about the same God we know today. Never get the Old Testament God mixed up with the New Testament. They are the same God and the exact same uh, person of the Lord Jesus that we see in the New Testament. And so as we look at these things, we'll bear that in mind that we are really talking about the same God and we'll see how everything ties in perfectly with the teachings that we can read in Psalm, it ties in perfectly with what we can read in the New Testament uh, as well. So a few things we can take out of Psalms as we uh, learn lessons. We learn to trust God's character as we ask God to show us his ways, teach us his paths, and lead us into truth as he teaches us. God wants to teach us. We have to learn of God. We also learn what it means uh, to not be ashamed as we wait on the Lord. We'll try to cover those points, and it's just a beautiful message that we can read out of Psalms. Some of them are well-known verses. I'm sure you'll know if you are students of the Bible and are diligent in searching the scriptures of truth. So uh, we'll go through those. Uh, Psalm 25 is a wonderful psalm, and it says, Unto thee, O Lord, I do lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth 
and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity. For it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him he shall teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever lift up toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and I have mercy on thee, for I am desolate and afflict, afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring me out of my distresses. Look unto me mine affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins. Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. O oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel for her, O God, out of all his troubles. It concludes in verse 22. May God bless the reading of his precious word to us this morning. Trusting God's character. Good and upright is the Lord. There is no injustice found in him. God is perfect in his judgments, which we may find unsearchable at times. Make no mistake, the, judge, the judgments of God are insearchable. Okay? We don't, some things we don't understand, and we are not meant to understand them. But we can know in the midst of not understanding at all, in the midst of ambiguity, in the midst of a, a time when we are troubled at what's going on, at the, in the midst of viewing suffering of the innocent, we can trust with 100% certainty that God is still righteous. We, let's, let us really understand that, okay? God is still righteous. God is still on the throne. People are not. Right? Government leaders are not. Even people in our own families are not. Family, spouses around us may not be righteous. Can touch close to home, right? And then you look at yourself in a mirror and say, I am not righteous. But God is constantly righteous and trustworthy. We really need to understand that, I think, especially in the day and age that we're living in. The world may look to leaders and to governments uh, to try to trust, uh, like uh, in stars or celebrities or uh, Instagram famous people uh, or stars and so on. But we'll find sooner or later they are not righteous. They have problems. Um, and uh, as we go on, we can uh, merely cite the opposite is true. In some cases, brutal violence uh, can be found in these leaders. 
and corruption. Corruption beyond our ability to even uh, speak it. Power corrupts a man. Fame corrupts a man. I think that is basically a universal principle, generally speaking. Right? Someone gets powerful. Someone gets a, a whole bunch of money. Somebody claims onto some political position. Instantaneously, they become corrupted, basically. Right? Because they think that they have glory. We've seen this over and over and over again with people in the world, haven't we? They lose it. Sometimes very suddenly, sometimes gradually. Over what? Power and position and self-glory. Right? We learn from that. That's why the Bible tells us to walk with lowliness and humility. Over and over again in the Psalms, it's talking about the humble the humble will learn the secrets of the Lord. He will direct them that fear him um, in verse 14. He will show them his covenant. We are to walk with the lowly. Assemble with the lowly. The world is rigged for people to seek their own glory. Isn't it? Like, I'm going to be Instagram famous one day. Really, I will, I will be, right? Let's not buy into that net. But why I want to just focus on the character of God here is because it's something that if we question God's character, we can get ourselves into real serious trouble, okay? And the world has questioned God's character. The devil has questioned God's character. Remember that from the uh, Garden of Eden, even, where he said, um, hath God said? Remember that? A simple question of God's character. Does God really know what he's talking about? Did God really tell you the whole truth? Right? The simple questioning of God's character stretches beyond uh, all that we can... Uh, imagine and put into words at this time. Um, so let's just truthfully look back at this and, uh, and really try to understand that when we question God's character, understand that the very foundation from which you have been created and which you have come from has to be questioned. Because the authority of God's word says what? God created you. Doesn't that make a lot more sense to trust in God's character? When you start looking at it from that perspective, he's your creator. He made you, right? Trust in God. Don't question the very foundation from which you have been created. You know, you're questioning your own existence, your own character in that sense, because God is your creator. Since God created you, and that does not change um, you are a vessel of his creation. Trust in him. He is holy. Now, how can we know God's character is good? And this is where we can kind of turn to some of the wonderful positive things in this wonderful message. How can you know God's character is, is a good character? Firstly, he has given us his word. We've just read a psalm. It was wonderful. Psalms have been a steady source of encouragement for Billions of people over the years, right? The Psalms, it talk. we considered the shepherd psalm, the Psalm 23, and uh, how it uh, ties into truth. People read that psalm and they say, that represents truth. Something about that psalm is talking to my heart. It is talking to the depths of my soul, right? It is true. It's not a lie. It's not just poetry. It is true. The Lord is my shepherd. And when I abide with him, I shall not want. It goes on. It speaks to your heart. The heart God longs for. The heart that God calls in God's word, we find he is never a politician, okay? God doesn't hide the troubles from you. 
He doesn't hide the issues or erase the problems of Israel and all the bloodshed and all the problems that happened with Israel when the enemies turned on her in times. God gives you the plain truth, as plain as day, in all of his great love. And uh, we rejoice that God is plainly pure, unadulterated truth. There is no injustice found in him. Secondly, the works of God's hand in creation and in divine order we can see with our own eyes, can we not? We can behold it. We can see God's work and his handiwork in creation. All of his goodness, right? Now, all creation we can see in the undeniable beauty of the earth. The animal kingdom, the universal firmament, and the heavens. We can step back and see and conclude, yes, God created this. God created man in the image of God. We can conclude that makes sense as we read Genesis. We see man with his ingenuity and creative character and wants to create things. And we say, yeah, that makes sense. We can see something that I've been able to see, and I think in our ministry, we've talked a lot about it. And that is the divine order that God has created in man, women, and children. Behold the family unit. Such a blessing from God who has given that to his all of his creation. Every family and culture, every culture and creed on earth, you'll see a family unit in order, right? From darkest Africa to the jungles of the Amazon to India, you'll see a divine family order. Man and women married and children being brought up and brought forth such a blessing of God and the family unit under Christ bound together in lifelong monogamy is really as good as it gets here um, on this side under God this is further direct evidence of God's goodness amen of his good character of his ability to bless. He invented it. He wants his creation to be fulfilled, blessed, and happy. He doesn't want, not want man to be isolated and alone and empty. He wants people to be f fulfilled. And um, just as a side note, like for all the countless single people out there and never married, this is a blessing you can look forward to and a work towards in God's holy will, right? Marriage and family, a family unit. What a wonderful thing to look forward to. What a blessed thing. The burdens of marriage are many, but they are wonderful and delightful at the same time, okay? And just as a side note, we know that there has been an attack on marriage in the family unit. yes. The devil doesn't want anything to do with it. He wants to curmudgeon people's roles. He wants to twist roles and so on. And we uh, at our ministry have really tried to work hard at countering that by presenting truth um, uh, for the strong, intact family unit. We want it to be what God has designed so that people can see the blessing of God and the true character of God. God wants family to be blessed, right? And so if the family gets ruined, people will say, well, what blessing is the family? Look at my family, brother. You know, I've had four wives and I have children all over. Uh, this isn't much of a blessing to me, I don't think, brother. Well, you haven't done it God's way. So we, if you do it God's way, that's when it can become this uh, blessing that, again, is evidence, direct evidence of God's absolute, complete goodness to us. And I can say after marriage of 16 years to a wonderful wife and family that it is a wonderful blessing, okay? And uh, we take joy and delight in that uh, as we 
work through things and build it up and uh, seek to be in God's holy will. So, family and marriage are evidence of God's goodness, of His good character and of His love for you and His willingness to bless you and bless you and bless you and give you something to work towards and, uh, and long for. Third, God has given us His only begotten Son to take our punishment. And that would be uh, reflective of the gospel message. The Lord has stood in our stead and was crushed for our iniquity. This, in the psalm, we read and hear the repetition of David asking for mercy. Right? David knew he needed mercy. When he prayed to God and he spoke to God, it was always... Mercy, Lord, I need your mercy. My sins are many. God heard that. God heard that repentance. Do you have that heart? Always have that heart before God. Repentance. I need thy grace, O Lord. I need thy mercy. Always we see that. Verse, uh, Psalm 25, verses 6. Remember, O Lord... Your tender mercies, your loving kindness, for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. See that? This is even as David uh, acknowledged that he walked in integrity and did not sit with adulterous mortals or with the hypocrites of the assembly of evildoers or sit with uh, the wicked. We read in the chapter over in, in um, Psalm 26. But at the end of verse 11 of Psalm 26, he still again asks for redemption. Even as he acknowledged, he is trying his best to be righteous. He doesn't sit with evildoers. He doesn't sit with hypocrites, with people that are blaspheming the name of God, with people that are making a joke and a mockery out of worship in the Lord. He doesn't do that. He says, notice, Lord, look, I, I haven't done that. I didn't sit with them. I didn't go to that party. I didn't go to that assembly. Right? He still asks for mercy and redemption despite his righteous works and his good deeds. Notice that? So, in like manner, we need to do that as well. This was a man who knew God closely, and he still asks to be redeemed and to find mercy in God. He wanted it renewed, refreshed, so must we, okay, we want the Spirit to renew us and refresh us. Spend time with Him, okay, even as our fleeting moments are running out and everything's trying to grasp your attention, pull you here, pull you there, right? Spend time with Him, even as we are frail and our time is short. Do not fall into snares or nets. And this is a picture we see the psalmist uh, painting often in the psalms and throughout the Bible. Notice verse 15. For he shall pluck my feet out of the nets. Out of the what? Nets. Nets are used to trap things. Nets are used to kill things. Any one of us could get trapped in nets. Let me warn you right now. They're out there. They're everywhere. And I couldn't help but to notice uh, and parallel this with uh, the idea that nets are something that usually attracts its prey with bait. Okay? It gives you bait. You get lured into the trap, and now you're trapped and can't get out. Fundamental thing. Um. And I noticed that the internet is called the what? World Wide 
web. Ah, uh, the net. Notice the root word, net. It is compared to as a net. Oh, the traps that are set there to put men in bondage as they cannot get out once they get in and they're trapped. Be careful that you're not trapped in the internet or the schemes of the internet, whatever they may be. What does it do? It stops you. A net catches you. It steals your mobility, your ability to move. The purpose and peace in mind delivers you into someone else's control. And in the worst case scenarios, it can uh, cause pain and injury to you. And even death. Traps are so common today, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. We see them. You will get caught in them. And it is suffice to say, sometimes we'll get caught in them ourselves. You could almost argue they're unavoidable. Uh, I myself, if any of you know me, I'm a bit of a sports fisherman, right? And what do we use? And even one of my daughters is with me as well. In fact, we've all been fishing. And we do trap things from time to time ourselves, okay? They could include salmon, codfish, and prawns. They smell something good. They see something good and they're attracted to it and they go into the trap. Unfortunately, the trap is designed for them. They can't get out, okay? And so that wonderful, beautiful spotted Pacific prawn goes into the trap, but he can't get out, I'm afraid, for him. But it's good for us, okay? Traps are out there. Um, sometimes we'll use real bait, like a real piece of fish, to lure the, tr the fish to bite the hook. But more often than not, we'll just use plastic baits or spoons uh, to spare expenses. Um, watch out for traps. But God in his mercy, we read, can pluck your feet out of the net. Absolutely nothing is impossible to God. After all, praise ye the Lord for his tender mercies. God can deliver you from the trap you may find yourself. Are you trapped? God can deliver you from it. Wait on the Lord. Trust in him. He can break you free. He can get you out. I guarantee you 100% confidence God has the power to deliver you from a trap if you find yourself Entrapped, and you can humbly acknowledge with all humility, as the psalmist did, and so many others, Ah, Lord, I'm trapped. I need your help. Humbly call upon the Lord, He will deliver you from your trap, whatever it is. Lastly, waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord and not being ashamed. Waiting for rescue. We recall from our love series that love is what? Patient. Remember? Patience talks about waiting. Waiting on the Lord. Verse 16. Turn yourself to me. We don't want God to turn his back on us. We don't want God to turn away from us. We want him, verse 16, to turn toward us with his loving arms of help and mercy and grace. And have mercy, of me, mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. See the admission there. I am desolate. I'm trapped, Lord. I'm encircled. I'm afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. 
Look on my affliction and my pain, right? And forgive all of my sins. Forgive me all of my sins. You want to be saved? Do you want the tender mercies of God? Do you want the power of God to work in your life beyond like anything you can imagine and to rescue you? Forgive all my sins, verse 18. See that? Key. Forgive. Forgive me, Lord. That's admission. Look what it's done to me. I'm in distress. I'm afflicted. I need your help. And God is there. Consider my enemies. In this case, uh, enemies have risen up against David. Do you have enemies? Does the Western world have enemies right now? Does Europe? Okay. They have risen up against me. He's crying to the Lord. And they hate me with cruel hatred. Hatred, there you have it. We need love. Always remember that principle. Even as we may have enemies, we love our enemies. We never repay hatred with hatred back. Christians never do that. But here the psalmist uh, points out that they hate him. Keep my soul and deliver me, he says. Again, keep it. Keep it. Endurance. And deliver me. What was in the Lord's Prayer? The disciples' prayer, remember? Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. Yes, there's evil around us. Some people say, well, if there's a God, why is there evil around us? Again, be careful when you're questioning God. Okay? There's evil around us, but we have a promise. The thrust is, deliver me from it. Okay? Don't go into it. God says, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. Deliver me from it. And then we thank God and trust in Him. Let me not be ashamed. Is anybody ashamed of the Lord out there? Are you ashamed you're a Christian? Are you ashamed to be associated with God? God forbid that attitude would exist among any one of us. We are not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We are not ashamed of the Bible. We are not ashamed to proclaim God's word as holy, true, and just, authoritative, written by God, inspired by God, synchronizes and is there for us to uh, help us through the life, our life, and prepare us. It tells us what's going to happen, and we have trust in it alone, not man-made philosophy, not religion, not dichotomies and sects of religious philosophy, but in Christ alone and in His Word alone, we trust. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed. For I put my trust in you alone. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. See that? Wait. Wait on the Lord. Do you want to please God? Wait on the Lord. Wait on God. Wait on Him with all long suffering. We are currently waiting on the Lord Jesus to return and call us home. To be His entourage, literally, when He returns to this earth to rule and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. But what does it mean to wait? Stay where one is. Or delay action until a particular time or until something else happens. To allow time to go by, especially while staying in one place without doing very much. Don't be distracted. Oh, I've got here to go. I can go here. I can go there. Stay still. Stay where you are. When you're waiting on the Lord, you're waiting until He comes. 
until something that you are expecting to happen does happen or until you can do something. Wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord. So therefore, we do not give up. We do not give in. We do not choose to wander about, but wait steadfastly on the Lord. Don't feel that God hears you, brother, sister. Wait. Feel like you've waited long enough and want to move on with your own pursuits? Wait a little longer. Okay. Feeling impatient? As the world has rigged you to be impatient? Wait. Wait on the Lord. Think you've prayed long enough? Wait a little longer and keep on praying. Ephesians 6.18 Keep on praying in the Spirit. Keep on praying. Keep on keeping on. Have you waited on the Lord all morning long, perhaps? Well, verse 5. Wait on Him all the day. Okay. Do we see a bit of a pattern here? Concerning waiting on the Lord? A bit of a pattern? Is there a reward to those who wait on the Lord? Yes, there is. You will understand in time why you wait on the Lord. Okay? It will become plainly evident why God makes you wait. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, 28. I hope we all know this one, but we can back up a little bit from the uh, uh, verse 31 and start from verse 28 of Isaiah 40, 28. And that chapter begins with that verse uh, prophesying the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and it said, it's co- and it starts off with comfort. Comfort, comfort. Um, my people, saith the Lord, uh, a voice of one crying in the wilderness. And uh, starting at verse 28 of Isaiah 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. That would be judgments as well. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And of course, we could spend another hour on that verse right there alone. But that is a wonderful verse. And it mentions the eagles. We are privileged to where we live right now. We can actually observe eagles, uh, a male and a female, who have been monogamous for life till death do they part. And they perch on a, tr- on a tree visible from where we are, from our house, uh, out the living room window here. And one thing I've noticed about them is not only their unbelievable flight capability, um, but is their patience their ability to wait. And sometimes I'm just uh, on the sofa and I'm like, how long is it going to sit there and perch for? And I have literally seen the thing perch for the better hours of the morning. Patience. Sometimes in the rain. Sometimes in inclement weather. Patience. Patience. Because even he knows the Lord will provide I have nothing to worry about. And it has for all these years, through the snows, hails, and everything. Those eagles come back, perch up, 
and somehow have not a worry or a care on their faces. They trust in the Lord. Can we do that? Can we trust in the Lord? Can we wait on the Lord? Not be anxious, but wholeheartedly trust our lives into his hands? Let us let, let, let that be our, our prayer. So in conclusion, we read clearly and we can see clearly that we can trust God's character. He is a good God. There is no unrighteousness found in him. There is no injustice found in him. We can entrust our very lives and our souls into his hand. And I would add that each and every one of us has to get to that point where you let everything that you have, that you hold dear to and that you cling to into God's hands as you trust in him. We are his. We were bought with a price. Right? Who else can we trust? The world? Government leaders? Materialism? Fleeing away? God is our only option in truth. We can see God's character in his creation and in the family unit, which we've talked about. We can see the very blessing with our own eyes. It doesn't take a lot of faith for that. This is something we can see with our own eyes and live out. The blessings of family and marriage with joy and laughter. And uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful reality we thank God for. This is evidence of God's handiwork and his character to bless his creation. Abundantly, abundantly bless them as we're content and satisfied. Say, Lord, you provided more than I have needed. Thank you, Lord, is our reaction. Thank you for family. Thank you for our wives and our children, our husbands and wives. Thank you for the order of your creation. We praise you. Mercy and grace has been offered in Christ. As we also know, Christ who knew no sin became sin for us. What a loving act of God with perfect justice. And he says to the Lord Jesus, his only begotten son, you're going to become sin as a substitutionary atonement for the fall of man. To be the Lamb of God that would shed his blood on the cross of Calvary so that we can be redeemed and forgiven of sin when we trust in the Lord and we call upon him and stay with him steadfastly and diligently. Never get pulled away. Never get sucked into these traps that we've talked about. Pull away. Be steadfast. Let our hearts be steadfast. It was another psalm we remember. My heart is steadfast, O Lord. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. So we're going to maybe try to go through the psalms as we go along more and just try to exposit more truth in there. Um, and uh, may we all be patient, wait on the Lord, understanding the schemes of the world, and try to wait on the Lord in our prayer life, in our devotion life, in our time that we spend reading the Word of God, the time that we spend uh, working on ministry opportunities, the time that we spend um, to the Lord in, in song and praise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your precious word to us that uh, redeems us and that reminds us that we can trust in you wholeheartedly and in your character of loving kindness and mercies that we read in the Psalms and throughout your word to us. So we pray that we can uh, be patient as we wait on the Lord in our own lives in a day and age that we live in that is so fast paced uh, and that is just getting crazy, Lord. We pray you can help us to be steadfast and wait on the Lord nevertheless, avoiding the nets and the pitfalls. And we pray that if we are in a net, that you could free our feet 
from it, that we can walk freely once again and be liberated in Christ Jesus. For it's our desire to be um, steadfast. It's our desire to wait on Thee in everything that we say and do and in our praise and our devotion lives to you. So we thank you for this time. Thank you for family that you have designed and instituted. And uh, we pray that we can be a part of upholding that um, and holding it to the standard that you have laid out before us in Scripture. So as we praise thee and thank you, we ask for your tender mercies upon us, ourselves. Pray you bless the video ministry and that people could seek your word diligently in a new and a fresh way and um, not be caught up in philosophies or uh, traditions of men. Help us, we pray, Lord, to see your truth plainly and freely. And uh, as we rejoice in your truth, we give you thanksgiving and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us.